Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Prophetic Events. Soon to come part 2 of 2. E.C. Hadley. 4th edition, retitled, 1991. Grace and Truth, Inc., 210 Chestnut Street, Danville, Illinois, 61832 USA Babylon. Babylon's doom is terrible, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The ten heads of the united ten power empire of Europe at the time they give their power and strength to the beast. Making him supreme dictator over all, will unite with him to destroy and put a complete end to this whole corrupt world church system. And the ten horns which thou essay west and the beast, J.N.D., these shall hate the whore, and shall make her naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For her sins have reached unto heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation, and glory, and honor, and power, unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornications, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up for ever and ever, Revelation chapter 17 verse 16, 18 to 5 to 8, 19 to 1 to 3. But while in heaven all rejoice at the judgment of the great whore. On earth her overthrow is only to make place for a deeper and fuller apostasy where the worship of the beast and his image and of the dragon will be enforced by a death penalty upon all who refuse it, see Revelation chapter 13. But has God revealed all this just to give us intelligence of the future? No. He would have it to work effectually on our conscience to separate us absolutely and entirely from all these evil principles of religious corruption and worldliness that are now at work in Christendom and soon to ripen into this awful iniquity. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, 1 John chapter 5 verse 21. Let us be on our guard against everything that would draw our hearts away from devotion to Christ. We cannot stop the downward trend of Christendom. The mystery of iniquity was already working in the days of the apostles, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7. God has held it in restraint, but the time is at hand when God himself will give Christendom over to its own wicked devices and imaginations and to the strong delusions of Satan. What shall we do then, since we cannot stop its downward course? Walk with Christ and for Christ in separation from every evil thing with a humble and broken spirit and also with a large heart that goes out with compassion for the lost and seeks to succor the weak and enlighten the ignorant. For let us not forget that in spite of the downward trend of Christendom God is working in grace to call out a bride for his son. And he will continue to work until the last soul is one that shall complete the true church, the Lamb's bride. And while he is working in grace, he would have his own to be the channels of grace, and the reflection of Christ's lowly walk of holiness, love and grace in the midst of the corruption of his day. Christ overcame and sat down on his Father's throne, so those who are overcomers now have the special promise of sitting down with him on his throne, see Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. The restoration of the Jews to Palestine. Isaiah chapter 18. This remarkable chapter gives us in figurative but striking and comprehensive language the return of the Jews to Palestine, first in unbelief, only to be trodden down during the Great Tribulation, verses 1 to 6. And then their final restoration for blessing under the reign of Christ, verse 7. For a right understanding of the prophecies it is important to see that there are two distinct restorations of the Jews to Palestine. The first, which has taken place in recent years, is in unbelief, only to receive the Antichrist when he appears and to be trodden down by the terrible judgments of the Great Tribulation. The second is the great and final ingathering so often spoken of in the prophets. This will take place at the close of the Great Tribulation when those that remain, scattered and broken and humbled by the Great Tribulation, will be restored for blessing in the land under the reign of Christ. The return in unbelief, woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. The rivers of Ethiopia are the Nile and the Euphrates. There were two places called Ethiopia or Cush, for so it is more often translated in our authorized version, one was at the headwaters of the Euphrates and the other on the upper Nile. So also of Libya. See Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 5 where the northern Ethiopia and Libya are, it would seem, referred to in connection with Persia allied with Russia and Goma. To return now to our verse, it opens with a, ho, not woe, as in the authorized version. It is a call of attention addressed to a country, shadowing with wings, that is, exercising a friendly protection. The location of this country is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that is, outside and beyond the boundaries of those ancient nations, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia. 
etc., along the Nile and the Euphrates and the countries in between these two great rivers. It is a country then outside and farther away from Palestine than those ancient nations with which the Jews in their former history were involved. That sends ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes, that is probably, light, swift vessels, upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto. A nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers, invading armies, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 7, have spoiled verse 2. The Jews are no doubt meant by the, nation scattered and peeled, a people terrible from their beginning, etc. But a great maritime power befriends them, and helps them in their return to their land. Notice, however, that there is no mention of God in all this. It is all human activity, political policy, etc., and all in unbelief. God is not the object in it, nor is it by his command, but it is in line with his purposes, and he providentially favors it and holds in check any hostile effort to overthrow it. It is as it were a setting of the stage for the great and final act of his dealings with apostate Israel and the nations of the world to clear the scene for the introduction of Christ's millennial reign. The English-speaking world has no doubt taken up this role of protecting and favoring the return of the Jews to Palestine and favoring the establishing of a national homeland for them there. When Great Britain relinquished its role as protector nation, the USA took up the role, definitely favoring the establishing of a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. In 1948 Palestine was partitioned between Israel and the Arabs, and the state of Israel as an independent nation became an established fact. Israel was admitted to the United Nations on May 10, 1949. There were then about one million Jews in Palestine. Since then thousands more have been returning yearly in unbelief, so that by October of 1967 the population of Israel was given at 2,700,000, and it is still constantly growing. Estimated population in 1981 was 4 million. 2017 was 6,800,000. No nation has been allowed to interfere seriously with this immigration and this establishment of a national government for the Jews in Palestine. In all this we see clearly the fulfillment of this prophecy concerning that land shadowing with wings, and the call to all the inhabitants of the world to, see, and, hear. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye, when he, this friendly power, lifts up an ensign on the mountains, and when he blows a trumpet, hear ye. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in, observe from, jnd, my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest, verses 3, and 4. These verses are a call of attention to the whole world. See ye, hear ye. It was an event of momentous significance when this protecting nation moved to establish the Jews in their own land again as an independent nation. It was an important step preparatory to the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies that speak of the Great Tribulation period and the coming of the Lord in power and glory. No period of time in the world's history is so full of significance for the world as that which immediately follows the restoration of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. But Mark, it does not say God blesses the Jews in their return to Palestine in unbelief. He observes it but he cannot bless them in their unbelief. He considers or observes from his dwelling place, like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in harvest. All is sunshine and refreshing at first, but suddenly the storm breaks and God's judgment overtakes them. For afore the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, or when the blossoming is over and the flower becomes a ripening grape. JND, he will both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches. They shall be left together unto the fowls, ravenous birds, of the mountains, and the beasts of the earth, and the fowls shall summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. Verses 6. They fall prey to the ravages of the anti-Semitic nations around, whom God uses as the rod of his indignation against his apostate people. A leader rising out of the territory of old Assyria, probably Iraq, called the Assyrian, or King of the North, so often mentioned in Isaiah, Daniel, and elsewhere, will become the ringleader of this terrible invasion with his anti-Semitic allies. And the King of the North shall come against him, the King of the Jews spoken of in verses 36 to 39, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horses and with many ships, and shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over, Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 45. So also in Isaiah chapter 20 verses 5 to 6, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge, to take the spoil, and to take the prey, and to tread him down like the mire of the streets. But then God's judgment falls in turn upon this godless leader and his allies. 
for though God will use this invasion to chastise and humble his earthly people, yet he will not allow the adversary to pour out with impunity hatred without scruple or bounds upon Israel. God will not sanction their implacable hatred, the disregard of pity and righteousness, and their contempt and pride against himself. As surely as he uses them to chasten Israel because of their failure toward him, so surely will he also righteously judge their wickedness. Wherefore it shall come to pass, that when the Lord has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. And the glory of his high looks, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 12, and on to the end of the chapter, please read and compare with Daniel chapter 11 verse 45, Joel chapter 2 verses 1 to 11, 18 to 21, and Zechariah chapter 14 verses 1 to 3. How admirable and wonderful are God's dealings with man. He glorifies his grace in the gift of his Son and commanding the gospel to be preached to every creature. But then after long, patient waiting upon the world to repent, he will finally meet every form of evil that manifests itself, however intricate or involved, with a suited judgment, displaying thereby his infinite wisdom, righteousness, holiness and his own divine and absolute power over all of it. The study of prophecy should impress one deeply with the conviction that God is above all and watching over all in an omniscience that sees the end from the beginning and takes note of every detail however little or great. But judgment is, his strange work, Isaiah chapter 28 verse 21, he is reluctant to strike, but when he must mete out righteous judgment he will do it thoroughly and yet with the ultimate end of blessing. By these terrible judgments he clears the world from every form of evil and wickedness to make way for the thousand-year reign of blessing under Christ. This overwhelming judgment that finally falls upon these nations is such a display of God's majesty and power, righteousness and holiness that those that escape of these nations gathered against Jerusalem will go and declare his glory among the Gentiles. And they will bring all the Israelites wherever they are scattered, for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with a flame of fire. It shall come, that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. And I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, etc. Isaiah chapter 66 verses 15 to 24, read the whole passage. Then it is that we have the fulfillment of the last verse of our chapter, Isaiah chapter 18 verse 7, In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts. The Mount Zion, note that this time it is, unto the Lord. The nations take part in it with a view of pleasing him. The Lord will be exalted by them in it. This is the last and final ingathering of all Israel of which so many prophets speak. See Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 6 to 35, 28 verse 26, Jeremiah 30, 31, and Ezekiel 34, 26 to 27. It will take place at the close of the great tribulation which will fall upon the world after the rapture of the church. See Matthew chapter 24 verses 29 to 31. The Antichrist. In our last section we saw that the Jews are returning to Palestine in unbelief. We will now look at a few prophecies that speak of their leader who will soon appear and be received by them as their long-expected Messiah. But he will be a false one. Take your Bibles now and turn to John chapter 5 verse 43. Here we have Christ's own words, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not, if another shall come in his own name him ye will receive. Christ, their true Messiah, came but they would not receive him, another shall come in his own name and by Satan's power, and him they will receive because he suits their wicked hearts. Now turn to Revelation chapter 13 verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. Here is one who has an appearance like a lamb. He has two horns like a lamb. It was in the strong horns of the ram or he goat that lay the power to subdue and dominate the flock so that the horns were taken by the ancients as the symbol of power to rule or govern, Psalm chapter 75 verses 4 to 5, 92 verse 10, and 148 verse 14, etc. This beast assumes a power, then, over the people that is in appearance like that of a lamb. He makes a pretense of being the true messiah, but, he spake like a dragon. Ah, yes, he is the dragon's mouthpiece, he is Satan's man, his false messiah, and antichrist. And now let us read verse 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Yes. 
That is it. He does not exercise a power that comes from above, but that of the first beast of this chapter. He is his associate and delegate. The two are in intimate league together. The first beast of this chapter with the ten horns, to whom, the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority, is, as we have seen in a previous study, the head of the revived Roman Empire. He is the dictator over the United Kingdoms of Europe. The second beast, verses 11 to 18, is the false messiah or antichrist, called in Daniel chapter 11 verses 36 to 40, the king. He is the dictator of the Jews at Jerusalem. Both beasts are working together. Many think that when the Antichrist comes he will reign over the whole world, but a more careful study of prophecy will show that this is a mistake. There is a trinity of evil that works together, the dragon, that is Satan himself, and these two beasts. The first beast is the political head of Rome and the United Kingdoms of Europe, with the Jews also in league with him. The second is the head of the Jews at Jerusalem. He exercises the power of the first beast politically as his delegate, but religiously he seems to exercise a power far beyond the Jews. He works great miracles through the power of Satan by which he deceives the world and imposes the worship of the first beast and his image upon all. That is why he is also called, the false prophet, Revelation chapter 16 verse 13, 19 verse 20, 20 verse 10, but compare with Acts chapter 7 verse 37 and Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 to 19. He is Satan's counterfeit prophet as he is also the counterfeit lamb or messiah. He causes the earth and them which well therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth. That they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life breath unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. Or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, Revelation chapter 13 verses 12 to 17. This is where all our present trend to government control of labor and commerce will end with these two men at the head and using it to enforce the worship of the Roman beast and of the dragon. Let us turn now to Daniel chapter 11 verses 36 to 39 and we will see how completely it agrees with Revelation chapter 13. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous monstrous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation shall be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, that is, the desire of every Jewish woman to become the mother of the Messiah, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, the God of fortresses, J.N.D. Note God with a small g, not a capital G, and a God whom his fathers knew not will he honor with gold, and silver and with precious stones, and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange god. He will magnify himself above every god, yet in his self-exaltation he will have a god unknown to the Jews before this, whom he will honor and cause to be worshipped, called the god of forces, or fortresses. Who is this god of forces? Does not Revelation chapter 13 verses 12 to 15 give the answer? It is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13, the Roman dictator, who will be possessed by Satan himself and who will have at his command all the vast military forces of the ten United Kingdoms backed by the power of the devil and all his host of demons. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verses 4. The devil himself is the god of this world system, see 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. This man, the head of United Europe, who will be at Rome, under whose command will be all the military might of Europe, will be the devil's man. He will be possessed by the devil and inspired by him and backed up by all his hosts of demons. He will be worshipped as the god of power together with the dragon. The Antichrist uses his religious power to enforce this worship. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 we get the man of sin, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and all deceivableness of unrighteousness in him that perish. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Read the whole passage, vv. 3-12. Who is this man of sin that exalts himself above all that is called God? 
from Daniel chapter 11 verses 36 to 39, the passage we have just been looking at, it is certain that this willful king of the Jews, the Antichrist, will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. He shall not regard God nor the promised Messiah, but shall magnify himself above all. Yet in spite of that he honors another as the God of forces. So in Revelation chapter 13 the false lamb enforces the worship of the Roman beast upon all. So it is really difficult to say just which one of these two beasts is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As both exalt themselves above God and claim the worship of all and both are intimately associated together and equally inspired of Satan. It would seem, however, by comparing 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with Revelation chapter 13 that the first beast is the one that is worshipped and that the miracles and signs that are used to deceive the people and enforce his worship upon all are wrought by the second beast. At any rate it ought to be clear to all that it is the second beast with horns like a lamb, that is the Antichrist, the false lamb. How bold and open will sin of every kind be when, the man of sin, is worshipped and exalted above God. What a cesspool of sin and corruption the so-called Christian world is fast sinking into. It will surpass all that has ever been in the worst day of heathenism of the past. Sin will be exalted and righteousness abased, morality will be despised and immorality spoken well of, Satan, that murderer from the beginning and liar and arch-deceiver, will be honored and God opposed and his Christ made war against. And the remnant that will dare to speak in favor of God or his Christ will be persecuted unto death. Brute force will reign, not justice, truth will lie fallen in the streets, peace will have taken its flight from the earth, driven away by hatred, strife, war and every evil work. Gross darkness will cover the face of the earth, Isaiah chapter 59 verse 14, and 60 verse 2. John tells us, little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Read the whole passage in 1 John chapter 2 verses 18 to 27 and 4 to 1 to 6. Satan has ever been opposed to Christ. He and his host of demons are ever busy to bring discredit upon him and his atoning death and saving power. All forms of false religions have been invented by Satan to keep people from turning to Christ, and the professed church has been filled with teachers who are ministers of Satan posing as ministers of righteousness, inculcating their false doctrine to undermine Christ and exalt man. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 13 to 15. They speak against his virgin birth and deny his deity. Or claim that all men have a divine spark in him that they have only to fan into a flame to be like Christ without needing to be born again or needing Christ's atoning blood to cleanse them from sin. Protestantism is filled with modernism and Catholicism exalts Mary above Christ, blasphemously calling her the mother of God. Then you have Christian science, unity, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. All these are only parts of one overall plan of Satan to discredit Christ and prepare the world to accept the Antichrist with his system of Satan worship. How timely then the warning of the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2 verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Daniel 70 weeks. 70 weeks are apportioned out upon thy people and upon thy holy city, to close the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make expiation for iniquity, and to bring in the righteousness of the ages, and to seal the vision and prophet, and to anoint the holy of holies. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 JND. This 70 weeks takes us right to the threshold of the millennium. The Jews not only had a Sabbath day every seventh day but also a Sabbath year every seventh year. The root meaning of the word week here in Hebrew is seven, and it was used to designate not only a week of seven days but also a week of seven years. Seventy weeks then would be seventy times seven or four hundred and ninety years. This is divided in verse 25 into seven weeks, which is the time taken to rebuild the city after the Babylonian captivity, and then sixty-two weeks following that till the Messiah. 7 plus 62 gives us 69 weeks or 483 years to the Messiah. From the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, are 7 weeks, and 62 weeks. The street and the moat shall be built again even in troublous times, verse 25, JND. And then in verse 26 we read, still quoting from the Darby translation, and after the 62 weeks shall Messiah be cut off, and shall have nothing. 
and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with an overflow, and unto the end, war, the desolations determined. Two things are especially noted here. First, the Messiah would be cut off and have nothing, no kingdom. This was fulfilled at the cross. Second, the city, Jerusalem, would be destroyed by the people of the prince that shall come. The prince that shall come, is the last dictator of the revived Roman Empire, but his people, the Romans, destroyed Jerusalem under Titus in AD 70. And then comes the last or seventieth week, which is yet future, in the twenty-seventh verse, and he, the Roman prince that shall come, shall confirm a covenant with the many, of the Jews, for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, these are the sacrifices that the Jews will offer in the temple soon to be rebuilt at Jerusalem. And because of the protection of abominations, the image of the Roman beast, Revelation chapter 13 verses 14 to 15, there shall be a desolator, the king of the north, called also the Assyrian, Isaiah chapter 10 verses 5 to 6. Even until that the consumption and what is determined shall be poured out upon the desolate, J.N.D. Thus this last week yet future, which will begin with a covenant confirmed between the head of the revived Roman Empire and the Jews in Palestine, is divided into two equal periods of 3.5 years each. During the last 3.5 years, the consumption and what is determined, is poured out upon the city. Isaiah also mentions this consumption determined, see Isaiah chapter 26 verses 20 to 21, 28 verse 22, and Christ, referring to this same thing, calls it the great tribulation, see Matthew chapter 24 verses 15 to 21. You will notice that between the 69th week and the 70th week yet future there is a long space of time not reckoned. It is during this time of God's suspended dealings with Israel that the church comes in. After the crucifixion of Christ by the Jews God sets them aside for the time being as his people, and reckons instead the believers in the crucified and risen Christ from both Jews and Gentiles as his people. Called to be the bride of the risen and glorified Christ. When this bride is completed, then Christ will come for her, and present her to himself in the heavens, John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3, E.P.H., 527, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 to 17, etc. After that God will turn again to his ancient people and begin his special dealings with them to purify them in the furnace of affliction under his chastening hand preparatory to the thousand-year reign of Christ. These special dealings with Israel just before Christ comes to reign take place during this week of Daniel's 70 weeks and especially during the last half of it, commonly known as the Great Tribulation. The King of the North. In our last study we saw from Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 that the Jews in their final apostasy under their false messiah, the Antichrist, will take refuge under the wings of the Roman beast. They will set up an abominable image of this Roman dictator in their temple that they will soon build at Jerusalem, and they will worship it and the dragon. They will put their trust in the military power of the Roman beast for protection. Because of this, God in judgment upon them brings against them, as the rod of his anger, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 5, a desolator, from the north, who heads a mighty invading army. We will now look at a number of prophecies about this desolator. In Daniel 8 the ram, verses 3 to 7, represents the Medo Persian Empire and the he goat, Alexander the Great, the king of Greece, verses 5 to 8, and 21. At his death his kingdom was divided into four kingdoms out of the country that one of these kingdoms to the north of Palestine had dominion over. There will arise, in the last end of the indignation, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, and, he shall destroy the mighty and holy people, the Jews, and shall also stand up against the Prince of Princes Christ at his coming as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. This brings to a climax his God-defying career and calls down immediate judgment upon him, he shall be broken without hands, see verses 19-25. This same king is called the king of the north, in Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 45, which we will now turn to, as there we get more details about him. Daniel 11 gives a detailed prophecy of the wars between the kings of two of the monarchies that arose out of the Grecian Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. One was Egypt, to the south of Palestine and the other was to the north. Verses 1 to 34 have already been fulfilled. Verses 21 to 32 present prophecy about that notoriously wicked king of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes, B.C. 175 to B.C. 165, who defiled the temple of the Jews. Verses 32 to 34 are a general prophecy of the Maccabees who lived during a portion of the period between Malachi and the birth of Christ. And verse 35 speaks in general terms of the persecution of the remnant that begins then but carries us on to the time of the end. The whole period of this present dispensation.
in which God is calling out a people from Jews and Gentiles to be the heavenly bride of Christ and to reign with him in his coming glory, is passed over in silence. As we have seen before, the whole church period from Pentecost to the rapture of the believers comes in as a parenthetical period of time not reckoned in connection with Israel. Because during the church dispensation God's relation with Israel is temporarily suspended to be resumed only after the rapture. Then verses 36 to 39 suddenly introduce the willful king of the Jews who shall be at the time of the end after the rapture of the church. This is the false messiah, the Antichrist, who will be the dictator of the Jews in Palestine as we have seen in one of our previous studies. Verses 40 to 45 are a prophecy of the king of the north, at the time of the end. This king of the north in Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 45 is the same as the king of fierce countenance, in Daniel chapter 8 verses 23 to 25, who destroys the holy people, and stands up against the prince of princes. Let us read these verses. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south, Egypt, push at him, the willful king of the Jews at Jerusalem, the Antichrist, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, Palestine, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom. And Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon, they join in league with him, see Psalm chapter 83 verses 6 to 7. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 43. This forcefully describes the devastating invasion of the king of the north in the days of the Antichrist. At the head of a mighty northern confederacy, he sweeps down through Palestine, lays waste the whole land and goes on into Egypt and conquers it. Then while still in Egypt, tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles, tents, of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, that is, at Jerusalem. But the Derby translation reads, between the sea and the mountain of holy beauty, which would place his camp between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him, verses 44, and 45. Now turn back to chapter 8, verses 23 to 25, and see how what the prophet says there of this same king of the north, agrees fully with this. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, that is, he is backed by another great power, which is no doubt Russia. As we see, in a later invasion by Russia all these northern countries are in league with her, Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 5 to 6, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. The Jews, though apostate at this time, are holy by calling and will be purified in the furnace of these awful afflictions. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, there is no principle of justice here, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the Prince of Princes, Christ. But he shall be broken without hands. Christ comes in his glory with his armies of glorified saints and the holy angels. To destroy the beast of Rome and his armies gathered in the north of Palestine at Armageddon, see Revelation chapter 16 verses 14 to 16. 1714, 1911 to 21. And the king of the north, who has by then returned from Egypt to Palestine, will also stand up against Christ, but will be destroyed without human aid. In Psalms 74, 79 and 83 we have a prophecy of the prayers of the godly Jewish remnant during the time of this great invasion by the king of the north. From these Psalms we learn that the temple will be burnt, Psalm chapter 74 verses 7 to 8, and Jerusalem laid in heaps and the whole land of Palestine laid waste, Psalm chapter 79 verse 1. 7. How marvelously all this is in perfect harmony with what we saw in our former study of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. There shall be a desolator even until that the consumption and what is determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. 927, JND. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 2 tells of this same event. Isaiah speaks of this even in Isaiah chapter 8 verses 5 to 10, 10 to 5 to 34, 14 24 and 25, 30 to 30 to 33, etc. In Isaiah's prophecies and in the Psalms and some of the minor prophets this king of the north, who heads this great invading army is called, the Assyrian, because in the days of their prophesying Assyria had dominion over all these northern countries. 
and then too the kings of Assyria in their bitter invasions against Israel in the past are a type of the leader of this anti-Semitic invasion at the time of the end. These prophecies about the Assyrian in Isaiah have had in a small way a partial fulfillment in the invasions of the past. But their real purport points forward to the time of the end to this invading king of the north, who is the last representative of the old Assyrian against Israel. In studying these prophecies, while they do give us a marvelously complete outline of events that are soon to transpire, our main object should be to grasp their moral character. Every form of wickedness and defiance against God and his Christ and injustice against his chosen people comes to a head in these events. And how wonderful is the wisdom of God in dealing with each actor in this wicked drama. He patiently bears with them and overrules in his sovereign disposal of all things so that their wicked designs upon his people become his means of chastening and purifying them and breaking down their rebellion. And then in due time, when their wickedness and arrogant defiance against himself comes to its full, he visits them in righteous judgment, but in such a way as to glorify Christ. For as we see, for example, in this wicked king of the north, he prospers, Daniel chapter 8 verse 24, in his wicked course, for God is allowing it for the chastisement of his own people, until he stands up against Christ, the prince of princes, and then he is overthrown by an irretrievable judgment that brings a righteous retribution upon himself and worldwide glory to Christ, the mighty victor. Then another point should impress us forcibly in the study of prophecy. That is, how God from the beginning knows every detail of the future movements of man, both individual and collective, even when his actions are prompted solely by his own wicked designs and inspired of Satan. And not only does he know of men's future movements, but he has so full and complete control over them that he will use them for the furthering of his own purposes to manifest and to break down every form of wickedness and pride of man and to exalt Christ. How our hearts should be filled with wonder and worship before such an all-wise and almighty God. And not only so, but knowing ourselves to be the objects of his love it should also give us a settled peace of heart now in whatever circumstances come up to try us. We know that he is in complete control of them and is using them in his designs of grace towards us for our good. If some injustice is done against us by a wicked person, it is allowed of God to bring out the graces of Christ in us just as the enmity of man always brought out the grace that was in Christ. What a peace it gives to ever abide in the consciousness that we and all that concerns us are in his mighty hands. So we can boldly say with peace and quietness in our hearts in whatever circumstances we are in, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose, Romans chapter 8 verse 28. An outline of coming events. In comparing the passages that have been before us, we get a clear outline of events that will take place during the last three and one half years that close this world's history before the reign of Christ. We will now sketch briefly this outline, Palestine will become the center of the last world conflict. The Jews, returned to Palestine, will enter a league with the head of the revived Roman Empire composed of the ten United Kingdoms of Europe, Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, Isaiah chapter 28 verses 14 to 18, Revelation chapter 13 verse 12. They rely upon his military power to protect them against the anti-Semitism of a strong confederacy formed by the countries to the north of Palestine. Russia will be backing up this anti-Semitic confederacy. When the Jews under their false messiah enter into league with the beast of Rome and set up his image in their temple to be worshipped, then God allows the anti-Semitic spirit of this northern confederacy to head up in a mighty invasion into Palestine, Zechariah chapter 14 verse 2, Daniel chapter 8 verses 23 to 25, 11 40 to 45, and Psalm chapter 74, 79, and 83. He uses them as the rod of his anger against his rebellious people to break them down because of their apostasy, but at the same time the ruthless, God-defying character of this invasion brings in turn. After he will have used it to perform his work of judgment upon the Jews and Jerusalem, God's judgment upon them to their destruction. See Isaiah chapter 10 verses 5 to 34, which describes an invasion which had a partial fulfillment in the past under Sennacherib. The prophecy goes far beyond that however, to this invasion we are considering at the time of the end, of which the old Assyrian invasion is a type. This invading army then swoops down from the north upon Palestine. But also has Egypt as its goal, Daniel chapter 11 verses 41 to 43. It lays Palestine waste and goes on down into Egypt and conquers it. Then suddenly, disturbing tidings will come to its leader out of the northeast that cause him to turn back, Daniel chapter 11 verses 44 to 45. What are these tidings? Prophecy does not state it, though other prophecies may lead us to a very probable inference. The revived Roman Empire of Europe, because of its league with the Jews in Palestine, enters with vast armies into Palestine and comes to Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo to the north of Jerusalem. 
the coming of the Roman army would cut off this northern army from its base. But in Revelation chapter 17 verse 14 and 19 verse AR 19 we learn that underneath it has for its real purpose to make war against the Lamb who will come from heaven with his armies of glorified saints and the holy angels, Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 21. Matthew chapter 24 verse 30, 25 to 31. But, you say, how do they know Christ is coming at this moment? Well, Satan knows the prophetic scriptures and we must not forget that the false messiah in Jerusalem and the Roman beast in Rome are in full league with the dragon and are his instruments. Also Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 to 14 shows us that this European army is gathered together by demon-inspired propaganda. Christ then appears suddenly when this European army is gathered at Armageddon and destroys it by the brightness of his coming. Though he is accompanied by the armies from heaven, they do not need to fight. A single word from the mouth of the Lord, figured by the sword proceeding out of his mouth, destroys them all. Revelation chapter 19 verses 15 to 21, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. What is man, whose breath is in his nostrils, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 22, to stand up in his supposed might against his mighty creator, son of man though he is by incarnation, yet always and ever the eternal son of God, by whom God made the worlds, and without whom was not anything made that was made. For by him were all things created, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 2 to 3, John chapter 1 verse 3, Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 to 17. The king of the north will have by this time turned back with his armies and pitched his camp at Jerusalem between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, Daniel chapter 11 verse 45, JND. He too will have the audacity to stand up with his army against Christ, but is destroyed also without hand. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand, Daniel chapter 8 verse 25, compare Daniel chapter 11 verse 45 and Isaiah chapter 14 verses 24 to 27. After the overthrowing of these armies, the Lord will gather together all the scattered remnant of Israel for his thousand-year reign. But before his reign is fully introduced another mighty army comes from the north under God to meet its awful doom, see Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel chapter 39. Gog and his army, read Ezekiel chapter 38 and Ezekiel chapter 39, these two chapters are composed of three prophecies, the first in Ezekiel chapter 38, the second in Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 1 to 16, and the third in Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 17, the first is addressed to Gog. It tells of the vastness of his army, verses 4 to 9, and the evil motive that prompts his invasion of Palestine, verses 10, and 11 and his signal overthrow by the glorious display of God's power as the God of nature and God over and above all things, verses 14 to 23. By this means God makes himself known to the nations. He will magnify himself and sanctify himself, that is, he will make himself to be respected and revered, no longer to be mocked or lightly spoken of, verses 16 to 23. In the second section, Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 1 to 16, we get further details. God's judgment does not stop with the overthrow of Gog's vast army, but he will send a fiery judgment throughout all his land and the nations that are associated with him, vv. 5, 6. The result then is given, and they shall know that I am the Lord, verse 7. The greatness of Gog's army is brought out by the fact that it will take Israel seven years to use up the wood of his weapons for fuel, verses 8 to 10. And it takes all the people of the land seven months to bury the dead, verses 11 to 16. In the third section, Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 17 to 29. The birds and beasts of prey are invited to the slaughter that God makes for them that they may feed to their full upon the flesh of the mighty men and drink the blood of the princes. A fitting judgment indeed upon those who boast in their power, and think to take by might without any respect to justice that which was not theirs by right. Then comes again the glorious result, and I will set my glory among the heathen nations, and all the heathen nations shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord the God from that day and forward. The prophecy in these two chapters is very simple and clear. It plainly points to a mighty invasion by Russia and her allies that meets with complete destruction by God sending earthquake, overflowing rain, hail, fire and brimstone in judgment upon them. God allows it and uses it to make known to all the world that he is God, that Israel is his chosen people, so magnifying himself and sanctifying himself in the sight of all the nations. Read again Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 16, 23, 39 verses 7, 13, 21, 28, and 29. But why should God have to make himself known? Do we not see in Russia today the reason? 
as a government they are not only denying the existence of God but doing all in their power to blot out all faith in the existence of a supreme being. They teach that all things are governed by natural laws and there is no God above nature. So we see how fittingly God will make himself known to these nations by using the power of nature for their overthrow, but so timed and controlled as to show himself God above nature and over all of it. But when does this all take place? And what connection does it have, if any, with the Battle of Armageddon, and the King of the North? This is a point about which prophetic students have differed much. But we believe a careful study of the subject and comparing this with other prophecies will prove that the invasion of God takes place at the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. Sometime after the Battle of Armageddon and the destruction of the King of the North, of Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 45, also spoken of as the King of Fierce Countenance, in Daniel chapter 8 verses 23 to 24. The King of the North, victoriously invades Palestine and Egypt and then turns back to Palestine and stands up with his army against Christ, the Prince of Princes, who will have just appeared and destroyed the European army at Armageddon. And so in turn he meets his own destruction. But we are told in Daniel chapter 8 verse 24 of this king of the north, that his power shall be great but not by his own power. That is, there is another power backing him up. This power is Russia, no doubt. Russia, doubtless, will gain a powerful influence over Iraq and surrounding countries, the territory of ancient Assyria. After the battle of Armageddon and the destruction of the king of the north, the remnant that will be scattered during the tribulation will return to the land. And the ten tribes will also return and be united with the two tribes of Judah. See Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 16 to 28. The Lord will set his sanctuary in their midst and will take his place upon his holy hill in Zion. Psalm chapter 2 verse 6. See also Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 28, 39 to 7. The twelve tribes of Israel will be at rest, in, the land that is brought back from the sword, and, dwelling safely in their towns without walls and having neither bars nor gates, see Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 8 to 12. Christ's reign will have begun and will have brought prosperity, Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 12, but it is not yet universal. Then God, the last enemy, comes up, and the awful judgment meted out to him and the countries in league with him makes the Lord's glory to be known and owned worldwide. It magnifies him and sanctifies him, so that his name will be set apart from all profanation and be much respected and his rule universally bowed to for one thousand years. Gog and Magog mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 is not the same as in Ezekiel, but is another army gathered at the close of the millennial reign. When Satan will be loosed for a season and go forth and deceive the nations and gather together from the four quarters of the earth a vast army like unto that of Gog and Magog at the beginning of the millennium. It is the spiritual counterpart of the Gog of Ezekiel, gathered together in the same spirit of audacious defiance of God as the Gog at the beginning of the millennial reign. The Gog in Ezekiel comes from the north quarters whereas the army in Revelation chapter 20 comes from the four quarters of the earth. They will gather to Jerusalem, but fire falling on them from heaven destroys them, vv. 7-10. That will end earth's history of rebellion against God. The judgment of the great white throne follows with the wicked turned into the lake of fire, and the new heaven and new earth appear, the eternal state is introduced. There are other prophecies that refer to the invasion of God, see Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 17. Psalms 20, 46, 83, and Isaiah chapter 10 verses 28 to 34, 14 verses 24 and 25, 33 verse 1, 66 verses 18 and 19, and Joel chapter 3 verses 1 to 2, 9 to 17 probably all. The king of the north, of Daniel 11 is referred to in Isaiah and in the minor prophets as the Assyrian. Since he comes from the territory of the old Assyrian empire and is characterized by the same bitter enmity against Israel and defiance of God as the kings of old Assyria, see 2 Chronicles chapter 32 verses 14 to 15. But after his destruction Gog, who rules over the country still further north and who was backing up this first invasion, continues the same role of bitter enmity against Israel and open defiance of God. Thus he is also referred to in some of the prophecies as the Assyrian. In a number of these prophecies it is somewhat difficult to say whether they refer to the king of the north, that God uses as his rod of indignation against the Jews during the Great Tribulation, or to Gog who will back him up and after his destruction will head this last and greatest army from the north, see Joel chapter 2, Micah chapter 5, etc. There are two invasions from the north. The first is during the tribulation under the king of the north, who heads a league of nations south of Russia but has Russia backing it up. It is at first successful, Daniel chapter 8 verse 24, 9 verse 27, 11 verse 41, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 12, 28 verse 18, and Zechariah chapter 14 verses 1 to 2, etc. 
but finally he and his army meet the doom upon his return out of Egypt by Christ himself at his appearing with his glorified saints and his holy angels. The second and by far the greatest army ever mustered comes under Gog's leadership into the land of Palestine later, at the beginning of the millennium. It meets immediate destruction from the Lord who has already come and taken his place in Zion and who protects it. Read carefully Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 21 to 29 where the prophet brings out the great moral lesson of all these ways of God in his governmental dealings with Israel. By these means he breaks down all their rebellion and self-will and then pours out his spirit upon them and so makes them a blessing to all the world, thus fulfilling his promise to Abraham. And I will make of thee a great nation, and bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 12 verses 2 to 3. The glorious thousand-year reign of Christ. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. And bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season, Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 3. What a blessing for the earth when Satan, that great deceiver of the nations, will be confined to the bottomless pit that he should deceive the nations no more during the thousand-year-long reign of Christ. Some may ask why was not Satan bound before? When Christ came, he was stronger than Satan and showed his strength by chasing the demons and delivering their victims from their power, Matthew chapter 12 verses 28 to 29. He had power to bind the strong man, Satan, but the world would not have it. They preferred the power of Satan to Christ and cast him out. But God had a deeper purpose to accomplish, so Christ went voluntarily to the cross to make propitiation by his blood and obtain eternal redemption for us, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12. And now that the work of propitiation is accomplished, God is beseeching men through the gospel to be reconciled to himself, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20. This is what characterizes this dispensation. He is beseeching man and seeking to win his heart by love. Outward force will never win the heart. The world, hardened by its rejection of God's love in Christ, is fast being given over to Satan's power, and under his leadership it will soon head up in full and open revolt against God and against his Christ. As prophesied in Psalm chapter 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed Christ, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. This is a challenge against God by a world that has rejected his love in Christ and sets up its power in direct opposition to him and his purpose that his Christ shall reign. Grace having been rejected, the only thing left for God is to meet this challenge with his judgments and overthrow them by his power and set up the reign of Christ. This present dispensation where God pleads in grace is thus followed by one of power, which meets and breaks the power of a Satan-controlled world and binds its prince, the devil confining him to the bottomless pit during the thousand years of Christ's reign of righteousness and peace over all the earth. Christ appears then when he comes with his glorified saints and his holy angels as King of kings and Lord of lords treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, Revelation chapter 19 verses 15 to 16, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 to 8, and Matthew chapter 16 verse 27. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and an helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay, fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands, or continents, he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun, Isaiah chapter 59 verses 17, 19. Thus he executes just judgment on the wicked, crushes their Satan-inspired and God-defying rebellion, confines Satan and his host of demons to the bottomless pit, and sets up his glorious reign of peace and health, prosperity and joy such as the world has never known. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. Then, judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever, Isaiah chapter 32 verses 1, 16, 17. The curse is removed so that the ground brings forth abundantly and there will be righteous distribution of all. Under his righteous scepter there will be no taking advantage of one another. Where unrighteousness breaks out it will be judged immediately, Psalm chapter 101 verse 8, JND. Because evil is kept down by immediate judgment, there will be peace and quietness and freedom from fear and anxiety. 
and every man shall sit under his vine and fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. Micah chapter 4 verse 4. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah chapter 35 verses 1 to 10. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her. Nor the voice of crying, as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Isaiah chapter 65 verses 19 to 22. Death shall be no more, except as a judgment on some outbreaking sin. A man's life will be as a tree, and many trees are more than a thousand years old. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 9. Not only will Israel be abundantly blessed under Christ's righteous scepter, but all the nations of the earth shall share in this blessing. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10. O oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the heathen, nations. Psalm chapter 47 verses 1, 6 to 8. And it shall come to pass in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more, Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 to 4. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts of Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord, Zechariah chapter 8 verse 22. Then shall the temple described in Ezekiel 40 to 48 be built at Jerusalem and become the center of worship of all nations. The sacrifices will be offered as a memorial of Christ and a reminder that all the peace, plenty and earthly blessings they are enjoying are the fruit of Christ's unique sacrifice on the cross. From this all blessings earthly and heavenly flow. All things in heaven and earth will be gathered together under him as the supreme head. According to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself for the administration of the fullness of time to head up all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 to 10 JND. Christ shall be the king of heaven and earth, but he will not reign in person on the earth. There will be a prince of the house of David representing him on earth at Jerusalem while the heavenly saints will be associated with Christ in his administration of the kingdom from heaven. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 10, 22 to 2 we have the description of the heavenly Jerusalem, which is a figurative description of the heavenly bride of the Lamb during the millennial reign. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 8 gives the eternal state where the new Jerusalem comes down to the new earth. Verses 9 to chapter 22 to 2 are a sort of appendix that gives the description of the city during the millennial reign. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it, not literal light, but spiritual, compare Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 quoted above, and the kings of the earth to bring the glory into it to it. JND, and they shall bring the honor and glory of the nations into it to it, JND, Revelation chapter 21 verses 24 to 26. No doubt there is a literal city of the redeemed, but the description is clearly typical of the moral glory of the bride of Christ in her association with Christ in the administration of his kingdom. The kings recognize and bow to the authority of the heavenly administration. They do not go up into heaven and enter the city as the KJV translation might imply. Final revolt under Satan, the judgment of the great white throne. The new heavens and the new earth. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, see Revelation chapter 19 verse 20, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever, Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 to 10.
In Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 we read of an invasion that takes place under Gog at the beginning of the millennium. But the one spoken of in these verses in Revelation chapter 20 is a different one. It takes place after the millennium and is immediately followed by the judgment day at the great white throne. It is, indeed, astonishing to many that Christ's reign will end in an open revolt against him. And some may say, why release the devil and let him go forth to deceive the nations again? God's ways are ways of infinite wisdom, and it does not become us with our limited intelligence to question them. However, a reverent inquiry into God's ways, not to call them in question but to learn from them, will well repay us and will cause us to exclaim with the Apostle. Oh the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! For of him and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen, Romans chapter 11 verses 33 to 36. Millions of children will be born and grow up during the millennium who will have never been subjected to any test of faithfulness to Christ. The release of Satan will put him to a test whether, after many years of enjoying the blessings and peace under Christ's righteous scepter, their hearts are really attached to him. Alas, many will manifest that their hearts love evil rather than good by turning to Satan. Sad indeed, but such is ever the evil tendency of man's heart. Man has constantly, since the fall, preferred evil to good, and in every dispensation has lost the special blessings promised, by turning to evil. And so also the millennium will end by an open revolt against Christ. And all is ruined by man. But as ever God manifests his supreme goodness by rising above the evil and brings in something better. The heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. And in their place God will make a new heaven and a new earth, and God himself will dwell with man. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there by any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that overcomes shall inherit all these things, see Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 8. And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. It is all the glorious result of the sufferings of Christ on the cross, Colossians chapter 1 verse 20, and of God's grace that, in virtue of the cross, triumphs over evil and brings man into his own eternal bliss. And the Lamb is all the light thereof, Revelation chapter 21 verse 23. Concluding Remarks. Now, beloved fellow believer, why has God given us all this prophecy of what is soon to take place? Surely, not simply as information to satisfy our curiosity or man's natural hunger to know what the future holds in store for the world, but that we, having our eyes open as to the final outcome of all the world movements of today, might not be deceived thereby or let our hearts be taken up with them, but be kept clear from them. For God clearly warns us in his prophetic word that underneath all the world movements of our day there is a mighty, hidden force at work having but one objective. However diverse in outward appearance or pretense the movement may be, namely, to marshal all the world forces together in a God-defying attack upon Christ, whom they once crucified and whose grace and love they have spurned. O oh, beloved believer, let us be warned and keep our garments unspotted from this corrupt world. Be not deceived, whether hidden or open, underneath, Christ is directly or indirectly the point of attack in every world movement of today. Let us stand firm for him and for the honor and glory of his name. Let us witness for him for the little while that remains before he comes to rapture us to himself. This world will then be left to its doom under Satan's power. But we shall be with him and shall share his glory when he comes as the mighty victor to crush all the power of the enemy and the world's rebellion and set up his glorious reign of peace and righteousness. We will no doubt find it harder and harder to bear witness for Christ in a world of increasing hatred and open attack against him. But be sure that every time we bear witness to Christ it ascends to God as a sweet fragrance of Christ that he will not fail to reward even though the world despises and rejects it.